Wild Food UK uh, and this is part three of our little back to basics series that we're doing during the lockdown period. Now again I'm going to start off with a little apology, uh, one from me and one from the cameraman, uh, Fingers McGee as he's been named. Um, I think that was his little finger wiggling apology there. The one from me is that I want you guys to all know that I am not a botanist, I'm a forager so I occasionally get my families and my genuses mixed up but if you look up words and the names that I give you online, you will find the plants that I'm talking about. Uh, third little apology is that we're doing all this on an iPhone, um, so if the picture and sound quality isn't that good, there's not a lot that we can do about it at the moment. I do apologise for that. Now, on to the plants. It's a lovely sunny day, it's the 21st of April and spring has sprung. You can see colour everywhere. We've got our herb garden here, which before we moved in, this used to be a flower bed, but you can see we've planted our, our rosemaries and our bays and our thymes, and for some reason a curry plant. I did say to Rachel that we'll never use it and we never have. If you've got any good recipes for the curry plant, then please let me know because I don't think it's very useful. Um, but because this used to be a flower bed, there's still some flowers coming through. You can see the poppies, and uh, in the middle here, there's a flowering plant that every forager needs to know about. This is a plant called Monk's Hood, or Aconitum napellus. When it flowers, it will have this lovely dark flower in a hood sort of shape. Now, this is one of the most poisonous plants in the country. It is truly deadly. And uh, I'm loving the comments I'm getting from you guys. Um, one of the comments was to do a video on mugwort. Um, this plant, I believe, looks a bit too similar to mugwort for me to add mugwort into the Back to Basics videos. Plus, it doesn't grow in my garden, so I'll have to do that one for you on a longer video at a later date. But Aconitum napellus, monk's hood, do not eat anything that looks like this unless you really know what you're doing. Now, another comment, another question that I get asked quite a lot is, after you've touched a poisonous plant like this or a poisonous mushroom, do you worry about touching other things that you're going to eat? And I think I can just show you now with a demonstration that I don't. There's no plants or mushrooms really in Britain that can poison you through your skin, as far as I know. Um, you might get a small amount of toxin, but the only way you can really be poisoned by things like this and hemlock and your death cap mushrooms is if you ingest a reasonable amount of them. There are plants that I wouldn't touch, um, but not because of uh, poisoning, because of things like phototoxicity or the stings that you get on certain plants. So giant hogweed was a plant mentioned in Back to Basics 1. Um, that's a plant I would never touch, but not because it's going to poison me through my skin, because it's going to irritate my skin quite badly. So anyway, monk's hood. Another little look at the leaf. If you see something looking like that growing in the wild, do not have a nibble. Um, now there's loads of interesting things growing around here. We're not the most fastidious of gardeners. Um, in amongst all of the cracks here, we've got plenty of daisies, adding a nice bit of colour to the garden at the moment. Uh, you might be surprised to know that all daisies are edible. Um, and some people do like daisy leaf salad. Personally, I think they've got a bit of a strange flavour. It is very unique to the daisy, but they are edible. Um, they're not just for making garlands. And the oxide daisies, the big tall ones, um, I actually find them quite pleasant. The leaves of those do go into my salads every now and again. So back to basics, daisies, eat them if you have to. Let's head this way. We've got geraniums everywhere. Geranium flowers are edible. And in amongst the geranium, actually, right here, we've got some of our vetch from Back to Basics 1. But this one, luckily enough, I hadn't seen this earlier, is in flower. There's our beautiful vetch flower. And that flower tastes just like a pea, basically, straight from the pod, especially on a a lovely sunny day like today. It's got a lovely sweet 
pea-like flavour. Like I say, almost like a pea when you break open the pod. You know how lovely they are, fresh. If you've ever tried them, you will anyway. Um, that's what these flowers taste like. So they're absolutely great in salads, but only go for the purple flowers, as I said, in Back to Basics 1. Now heading this way, we've got oh, so much that we could talk about. Spring is amazing. The growth around here at the moment is fantastic. I do love a feral plant. We've got two types of feral parsley here that have escaped from my, um, my herb garden just back there. In amongst them though, this is a plant that we find all over our garden. Uh, this is, I think, wall pellitory. It's one of the pellitories anyway. Uh, I'm not sure about this plant's edibility, um, but I do know uh, or I've read anyway that it's supposed to be quite an allergenic. Um, I think in Australia this plant's called asthma weed, so you might want to know that if you suffer from allergies, hay fevers or asthma. Don't get too close to this plant when it's in flower. Let's keep heading this way. You all right there, Will? <laughs> good, good. Um, now down here, this is a plant that <clears throat> I could have shown you in any video that we've done so far, not the thistle, I did talk about those, but this plant here with these lovely little purple flowers, this is ground ivy, which is an edible and it grows absolutely everywhere. But much like uh, when I was talking about our herb Robert, there's some young herb Robert. I think there's some in flower over there, I'll show you in a second. Both of these are edible, but they are simply not worthwhile from a foraging point of view. They are quite horrible. In fact, the, the most fun thing I know about the ground ivy is if you crush it up and smell it, I was told by someone that it smells like used car showrooms, and it really does. Crush it up and have a smell. Now, have a look over here. This is something all of you should uh, see and possibly try and emulate. We've got our lovely bee hotel. Now these are all masonry bees. They're not dangerous at all. Don't worry about bees. You don't want to go disturbing hives. Uh, the females can sting you. But you can see there that bee hotel is just made out of chopped up bits of bamboo. So if you want something fun to do during lockdown, chop up any bamboo you find in your garden, put it into a little shape whatever you want to make like this and stick it to your wall somewhere and you will hopefully attract some of these amazing bees. We love bees. Um, hopefully some of you in the comments will be able to tell me what this slit here is for because <laughs> I've never been sure. I've never seen anything go in and out of it. I'm not sure if it's for uh, bats or, or maybe hornets. Um, hopefully one of you guys will be able to tell me. Anyway, all you need to make one of these is a bit of bamboo. Uh, what have we got around here? We've got some feral valerian. If you're into your herbal medicines, then valerian is an interesting plant, but from an edibility point of view, it's not one that we go for. But over here is one that I absolutely love. Now, it's growing here in the pots that I was growing tomatoes in last year. Now tomatoes, as you'll probably all know, really suck the nutrition out of the soil. So there's not much left in there. But this, our uh, hairy bittercress, this one is in the cardamine genus, <laughs> is a lovely edible plant that doesn't need much soil, much light, much nutrition, and it will grow almost anywhere. Now, when it starts out, it just grows as a rosette of these types of leaves. So you can see the opposing or almost opposing leaves with a nice terminal leaf there. They'll grow in a rosette. And then after a little while, you'll get these flowering stems shoot up with these delicate little white flowers. And these, which are the seed pods of the plant, you can see there's quite a few on this plant, each containing a number of seeds. And this plant only has a 12 week life cycle. So if you find one in your garden and you like the flavor of it, I really do. It tastes like a cross between rocket and, uh, and cress, as far as I'm concerned. It's just lovely in salads or a cheese sandwich. Um, 
if you like the flavour, then all you need to do is let one plant grow, let those seeds explode and spread, those seed pods rather, explode and spread their seeds, and you'll get 50 odd plants out of one plant in about 12 weeks. So a fantastic edible, much overlooked. There's quite a few in the uh, cardamine family. This one's hairy bittercress. We've also got wavy bittercress and uh, I think large leaved bittercress. And I'm gonna show you another plant in this cardamine genus pretty soon in this video. Um, it's one that we really, really like. When we find it young, what we often do is just pick a whole plant like this and then put it in a glass or a bowl of water on your windowsill and keep pinching off the flower stems. And then what will happen is that the plant will just keep growing leaves and uh, it won't fulfill its life cycle, its 12 week life cycle. So if you keep it on the windowsill, take away the flowers, you'll just keep getting leaves for a good few months. A really handy and tasty green to know about. All right, in amongst these plant pots over here, if you want to follow me this way, we've got another <laughs> feral herb. Just wait for that wind to pass and maybe get a better example, actually. It's a feral herb called lemon balm. Um, any of you gardeners that have planted this, you'll know that it's a, a mint family plant and that it will spread everywhere in your garden, given half a chance. Now, it's absolutely lovely smelling, but it is quite invasive. I do like mowing over this because as you're mowing, you get this amazing smell of lemon. But if you remember from the first video, mint family plants, and here's another one, have a key identifier. This one is in the same genus as our white dead nettle, the lamiastra, the lamiums, um, which are part of the mint family. And if you remember, the mint family is identifiable by the square stem that you can see on both of these. Now, all your mints are edible. Lemon balm is one that's got that lovely fragrance. Uh, purple dead nettle, this one here, isn't one that I use a hell of a lot in any of my dishes. I will use the flowers to garnish a salad though. Um, let's head, head this way. There's not, not many other places to go and I'll just have a quick drink of water. Honest. Let's head down here. <laughs> um, you can see the, the cracks in our patio here are just festooned with different plants at the moment. I love the colour that you get from the, the dead nettles and the dandelions and the daisies all growing around here. Um, and I really don't mind them being in the cracks. Here's a plant that I do mind being in the cracks, but it is one that us foragers uh, like for good reason. You can... Um, use these parts of the plant to make flower. This is pendulous sedge. And it's not anywhere near as big as it would normally be. It's got a very restricted root system here. It's just growing out of a crack. Um, but if it was growing in some nice fertile soil, it would be three times as big. And these flowering stems would be about maybe three feet tall at the most. What um, you would be able to see, you can't see on these tiny little thin ones, but the flowering stems of pendulous sedge are triangular. So if you have a pendulous grassy plant, when I say pendulous, it's this part, the flowering part of the plant that hangs down with a triangular stem looking very, very grassy, you've got pendulous sedge. And you can use these to make flower. Add them to your bread flour to make really nice rolls. Uh, you would want to winnow them a little bit, but pendulous sedge, this is one I am going to remove. Uh, and when I do, I'll probably harvest these bits. You'd need a hell of a lot more than you can see there to even make a, a small bap 
but I've got a hell of a lot more of this in my garden. It's highly invasive. It's not really one that I encourage. You just don't need to though, because it grows absolutely everywhere. Feral plants. We love feral plants. I'm always finding feral fennel and things like that out and about. Down here, we've got some chives. Now, these are our normal cultivated chives, but I'm gonna use them to uh, show you exactly what our native wild chives look like. They look exactly like this. You can see it's a circular leaf rather than a flat grassy type leaf. And like all of the other alliums, it has that very distinctive oniony stroke garlicky kind of smell. That's how you uh, can identify what we have in the wild in Britain. It's called crow garlic, Allium vineal, uh, and it's a tasty edible. The leaves become quite coarse, you know, a bit tougher than your normal chives, but they're perfect for cooking. And I find it in quite large quantities in the wild. You've just got to look for slightly darker green grassy patches and uh, have a close look if they're circular, crush them up and have a smell, you might well have found some of our wild chives. These ones, I'm pretty sure, I just escaped from my, uh, my herb garden again though. A Couple of other things I'm definitely gonna remove from our um, patio, these docks. You don't really want dock growing in your patio. Here we've got some wood avens. You didn't see them young in Back to Basics 2. But there's your young wood avens, if you remember. They look a bit like a strawberry. But then you get the opposing leaves running down the stem. Here's a new plant. Without going far, we've got this plant here, which is called Common Plantain. Plantago Major. Now there's, uh, I think, seven different types of plantain in Britain. I think. And they all have this similar, or they all have a similar vein pattern on the back of the leaf. You can see the veins run from the base of the leaf to the tip of the leaf. Now our docks there, as far as science knows, are pretty much a placebo when it comes to dealing with stinging nettle stings, but placebos work, the power of the mind. This plant is scientifically proven to, to have a positive effect or to help with the pain of stinging nettle stings. I've read that it's a, a mild anaesthetic, I'm not sure about that, but what I do know is that it's an antihistamine. Um, it's also apparently a mild antibiotic, but if you need antibiotics, please go to the doctors. Um, what it also is, is an emollient. So an emollient means that when you get the juice, the sap out of the plant, that sap will soak into your skin and it will um, take in all of those antihistamines and anything else that the plant has to offer you on a medicinal level, which means that it's good for any kind of rash, really, any kind of allergic rash. Obviously, meningitis is something very different. But if you've got an allergic rash anywhere on your skin, go for some plantain before you go to the chemist. Just grab a load of the leaves. I'll show you what I do. I'll have to get quite a few of the leaves to make this work. And this is what I would do for uh, someone with stinging nettle stings as well. Get a few more of the leaves from here. So you get the leaves. Get them in your hand and start rolling them around. You do have to apply a little bit of pressure. But then after a little while you hear something different. There it is, the squelch. And all that juice there, that's that emollient, antihistamine, antiseptic. Uh, I believe anaesthetic and mild antibiotic as well in that juice and that's what you rub onto your stinging nettle stings or any midgy bite or any kind of insect bite or allergic rash this stuff will help with. You can also eat it if you suffer from hay fever 
it'll help alleviate the symptoms of hay fever, as would local honey. I'm not gonna get any honey from my masonry bees, but if you can get local honey, that's another good little thing to help with uh, the symptoms of hay fever, which being as we've had such lovely weather and everything's coming into flower, some of you guys I'm sure will be suffering with hay fever over the next little while. Now, what else have we got here? Some very common plants. This is our ivy-leaved toad flax. Not a very nice name. <laughs> and it is, I believe, an edible, but again, it's not particularly tasty. These flowers, though, are uh, absolutely lovely at dusk. They seem to have a sort of iridescence about them at dusk. So we always leave this in our walls because it's uh, a very pretty flowering plant when it's in flower. Um, let's go this way. We've got a bit more of the garden to see. Lots of bits and bobs around. Got a young elder tree growing out of the stairs there. And some masonry bees that are currently <laughs> destroying this wall here. Another good reason to uh, build them a little house. If you watch this one here, it'll find somewhere. And they do actually burrow out these tunnels from the cement in your walls. And uh, I think just left to their own devices, they will probably deal with our little outbuilding here. Um, right, over this way, obviously, this is our hen house. And here's two of our hens. Hello, ladies. No, you're not talking to me today. Right, fair enough. Uh, down here, we've got a plant that should be uh, one that every forager knows about. It's very, very common. Uh, I have done a video about this before, so I won't spend too long, on, too long on it. But this is our hedge garlic. Or jack by the hedge or garlic mustard. Now, this is kind of the marmite of the plant world. Watch my other video for more detail, but it's one of those plants that proves that everyone's different because different people get a different flavor from this plant. Personally, I get three flavors if I eat the leaves and because of that, I'm not going to eat one. I'm uh, one of the unlucky ones. Um, I get initially a mild flavor of garlic from these leaves. But that's followed by quite a horrible bitterness, which finishes on a taste quite similar to eating a paracetamol tablet raw. Um, other people I know, Eric, who uh, you've seen in some of the other videos, he eats this plant and he just gets the flavor of mild garlic. It's one of those things like coriander is a, a plant that different people get different flavors from. So this is a plant that you should all have a nibble of and if it's just a nice garlicky flavor, then it's great for you, you can eat it, but just don't put it into a mixed salad when you've got lots of people around for dinner because there'll be some people there that find it absolutely disgusting. There's one part of this plant though that I find lovely. There's none of it down here, but none of it's mature enough. But when these flowers drop, you'll end up with kind of a legume-like seed pod. And I did mention one of its names is garlic mustard. And those seeds inside the seed pod, to me, taste just like Dijon mustard. And I do love mustard. So when it comes to seeding time, I'll come out here and I'll harvest all of the seed pods, strip the seeds out, mash them up, and you've basically got a lovely whole grain mustard. And uh, believe me when I say this stuff grows everywhere. Garlic mustard, jack by the hedge, Alaria petiolata, I believe is its scientific name. In the wider cabbage family, you can see that because it's got a cruciform flower and everything in the cabbage family has a cruciform flower and everything in the cabbage family, just like everything in the mint family is edible. Cabbages aren't the only things in Britain that have a cruciform, a cross-shaped flower though. So that isn't a rule, if you like. Um, 
Let's head a little bit further this way. We've got some more thistles. We've spoken about those. All thistles are edible. Uh, we've got loads of our hogweed, which has made its way into every video so far, as has our arum, both very common plants. Um, you do find them everywhere. Here's something I didn't get to show you in the other videos though. I showed you the hogweed shoots. This is the early, the young floret of hogweed. And I use these pretty much just like broccoli. They make a really, really lovely fake cauliflower cheese as well. When we run our courses, we make tarts out of these florets mixed with cheese on just a nice bit of puff pastry and uh, they are absolutely lovely. A nice vegetable. Um, hogweed, as I've said in every video so far, is one of our favorite things to go foraging for. But as I've reminded you, I think in most of the videos, uh, you don't wanna get the sap on your skin, particularly on a day like today, because the sap will uh, potentially make your skin burn. And I do know people that when they've got the sap on their skin on a day like today, they've ended up with really blistered skin which is not something that you want my skin's not too reactive to this stuff um, but if you do have skin that, that reacts badly to things um, like plants and stinging nettles then I would get someone else to pick this for you or I would pick it with gloves on now just uh, briefly I'm gonna jump over the fence onto my landlord's land. I have full permission to do this and I'll be back just in a second. plant that I absolutely love. It's another plant in the cardamine family. Do you remember the hairy bittercress early on? Look at the leaves there. You'll see that the leaves have the same formation, the same system as the hairy bittercress. And again, I've not managed to bring any back, but it would have started out as a rosette of leaves like this. Now, the leaves on this plant, cuckoo flower or lady's smock or cardamine pretensis, uh, the basal leaves are much fatter than this and generally much shinier than the leaves on your hairy bittercress. Now, those basal leaves are the ones that I really love on this plant. They taste, or well, we nicknamed this plant wasabi cress because the basal leaves really do taste like wasabi. These leaves on the flowering stem aren't anywhere near as tasty, but they're still perfectly good to go into your salads. And then so are these flowers. They have that lovely sort of hint of wasabi about them, but they're also quite sweet. So I'm happy to eat those. They're a plant that I find all over the place. It's very difficult to find uh, your lady's smock when it's not in flower, but if you look out for it, what, will, what you'll find is when you see it in flower, go back to that spot throughout the year and you will find those basal leaves growing in the same place throughout the year. It's a, a favorite of graveyards and anywhere sort of meadow um, type of environments. It will grow along the sides of roads and when you do find it in flower, you know that's your spot for uh, ladies smock and you can go back all year round, almost all year round anyway, and find those basil leaves just to add a nice wasabi kick to any salad that you make. Really, really tasty. Now, last few things. We've got our elder tree here. Again, I've done a video about elder before. We've even actually got a flower. So there we go, 21st of April, and we've got our first flowers coming out on the tree. Now, this is a tree 
that we foragers love because we make our elderflower champagne out of the flowers. We make our elderberry jams and our elderberry wines. And uh, we make elderberry, elderflower fritters as well. But everything we make from this tree has to be cooked or processed because these leaves are actually poisonous. In fact, the whole tree is poisonous. Do you remember the ground elder from Back to Basics 2? You can see why the two have the same name. They look quite similar. Obviously, one's a tree and one's a ground weed, though, so they're a little bit different. Now, these leaves and the whole plant, basically the whole tree, contain what are called cyanide-inducing glycosides. And those glycosides, if you ingest them, you will start to basically create cyanide inside your own body, as far as I've been led to believe. Either way, whether that's true or not, I know that these leaves and the berries even and the flowers are not something that you want to eat raw. You can destroy those glycosides by a bit of fermentation or cooking. So that's why you're okay with things like elderflower champagne and elderberry wine and elderflower fritters. But if you were to just get a load of the berries off of the elder tree and eat them raw, you can make yourself quite ill. I don't know why you'd do that anyway, because the berries, to be honest, they're not very tasty. They're really not worth the nibble. Um, look for something else that, that you can find to, to taste instead. Um, I did, in Back to Basics 2, say I was gonna try and finish every uh, little Back to Basics video on a mushroom. I might struggle a bit later on, um, but I've got a, a nice easy one here. Quite a lot of you, you microphiles amongst you watching, you'll know where I'm going to go with this and you may as well switch off now. But for the rest of you that don't know about the wood ear mushroom, I'll show you that now. Now, elder is pretty much the weakest wood in the forest. And because of that, you always get broken bits of elder, like this one, underneath them. And on probably half of the elder trees that I visit, you will find this mushroom. You can see it there. This is it, all dried up. When it's young and fresh, have a look on the website, you'll see pictures of it young and fresh. It's uh, quite a sort of gelatinous, succulent kind of looking uh, cup-shaped mushroom, which always hangs down. There are other mushrooms that the cup points up. With these, the wood ear mushroom. Please don't send me any comments about its former names. <laughs> With these, the wood ear mushroom, when they're fresh, they always hang down. Now, you find them on the majority of elder trees uh, with broken bits around them throughout the UK. And they are a mushroom that is used extensively in oriental cooking. So uh, you'll find in lots of recipes for your stir fries and Chinese soups and things like that, they'll mention the cloud ear or the jelly ear. Those mushrooms are very closely related to this one and they are exactly the same culinarily. So it's a mushroom that, because I don't do too much Chinese cooking, uh, I don't really use it very often. But it's a mushroom that my wife actually put into a curry not so long ago, which worked really, really nicely. And they're also a mushroom that you can do a fancy little thing with. You can rehydrate them. You see these are dry, and these are small ones. That's the mushroom dry. When you're cooking with it, you would rehydrate it with the, the stock of whatever you were cooking. But what you can do is make some funky little puddings with it as well. You can rehydrate the mushroom with orange juice, apparently, and add a bit of chocolate to the top and a biscuit base to the bottom and you've made a mushroom Jaffa cake. Another thing that I like to do is rehydrate them with a sort of chocolate sherry sauce and then coat them with chocolate. And you've got a kind of chewy, sherry chocolate mushroom sweet, which is actually quite pleasant. Um, give it a try, it's not for everyone though. Uh, so the wood ear, auricularia, auriculari judae, I think 
is the correct pronunciation of the scientific name. Good thing about this mushroom is if you find it growing on elder, you're pretty much 100% safe. I have not found any of its lookalikes growing on elder. I don't know if they do. Um, I have found this mushroom growing on other types of wood, but if you just stick to looking around your elder trees and looking for broken bits of wood, mushrooms that you find looking like this are almost definitely the woodier. Um, which is my mushroom I'm going to finish on today. So I really hope you've enjoyed this Back to Basics 3. I'm trying to run through as many of the things that I think everyone should know as possible, um, all of which are covered in much more detail on our website in the mushroom guides and the plant guides and you'll find recipes for these in our recipes section too. Um, so I hope you make good use of all of those things and I hope you enjoyed this video. Please feel free to leave some comments. Um, I'll just finish up by saying the same thing as I've said in all the Back to Basics videos. We're in this lockdown at the moment for a reason. So stay safe, stay positive. Try and find things to do like building bee hotels and stay away from each other as much as you can until we're out of this COVID outbreak that we're dealing with at the moment. Hope you enjoyed the video. As I said, thank you very much and I'll try and do another one next week.